Now, good evening all. Uh, we'll make a, a slow start so that we can give um, people a chance to, to trickle in. We've still a few joining us. Uh, you're all really welcome to this evening's uh, webinar. Delighted to see you on this lovely summer slash autumn evening. Um, my name is Anya Bird, for those who don't know me, and I am coordinator of Burn Bio Trust. Um, and we're delighted this evening to have something a little different, I think, for our uh, Wednesday webinar for August. Uh, we have Conor McGrady, who's going to uh, speak to us for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and Conor, as I'm sure you'll know if you've uh, signed up to attend, is an artist. Um, but he works as well uh, as Dean of Academic Affairs um, and Head of Painting and Drawing at the Burren College of Art. So I personally am really looking forward to hearing um, more about the College of Art and then about, I suppose, the Burren and art and creativity. So uh, with that said, I will hand you over to Connor. Sorry, just also to mention, um, if you have questions uh, that you that come to you as Connor speaking, pop them into the Q and A um, or the chat, and we'll, we'll hope we have time at the end to put some of those uh, to Connor. But with that said, I say thank you very much, Connor, and over to you. Thank you, Anya, and then thanks everybody uh, for joining. I know it's just been an absolutely gorgeous evening outside, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's just nice to to engage, I suppose, to on the on a, a discussion about creative activities as the summer starts to wane a bit. So hopefully you can hear me okay. And apologies in advance. I'm 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 battling a little bit of a sinus trouble. So uh, I may sound a little bit nasally, but uh, I'll I'll do my best to be clear and to to communicate as as clearly as possible. So um. As Anya uh, said, I'm uh, the Dean of Academic Affairs at the Byrne College of Art, and uh, I'm also a practicing artist. So uh, so I'm just going to take you through. I'll get, what I'm going to do this evening is just give you a brief overview of, of, uh, of, of the college, uh, not, not, a, not a history lesson, but just a very brief overview of, of, of what the college is and does, and then really just get into talking about the different way that artists and, and creative individuals, students, artists, and residents uh, engage with the burn as place, as landscape, as place, as ecosystem, and as community. So that's the plan for this evening. And I am trying to advance slides without any luck. So let me just see if I can uh, get this operational here. Oh, there we go. Um, can everyone see that? Okay, yeah, hopefully, yeah. So inspiring art in the barn, uh, engaging place, landscape, and ecology. So, you know, again, I'm not sure where everyone, you know, who has joined where you're from, even if you're, if you're based in the area. If you are, of course, you'll know that the burn is this unique karst uh, limestone landscape. And, uh, and the college sort of is, is located close to Bally Vaughan, uh, right in the middle of this landscape. Uh, as I'm sure you know through your engagement, uh, your engagement with Bar and Bio, who are one of our partners in the uh, one of the college's partners that, that it's a protected landscape uh, and it's it's a it's a unique ecosystem uh, and it has, and because of its uniqueness it's, it's been a magnet for for artists for writers for scientists for for botanists uh, for people from all sorts of creative dif disciplines and scientific disciplines uh, for well over well over a century and, and beyond that the people have traveled to the bar and this is this, this, this place of engagement this is a, an image of our campus here, just outside Valley Vaughan. We have a 16th century tower house uh, on, on campus that often gets used uh, for, for poetry readings, for, um, for different art events as well. So we're a small college. And we were founded in 1994 uh, by Michael and Mary Hawks Green. Uh, Michael sadly passed away a few years ago. And, and Mary, who's, who's uh, our president, the president of the college, uh, continues to um, run the college, steer the college uh, in, uh, in terms of keeping you know true to the ethos in which it was established. And, and part of that ethos was that um, that Michael uh, had was, had worked in a hotel had been in the hotel industry in Ballyvaughan and had been aware of the power of the barn as a place to draw artists uh, you know for over over as, as I said over the, the entire last century. And I think it was this sense of creative flow into the into the area that served as inspiration to start an art college in this remote landscape. 
so the college is unique in that respect. It's it's one of the very few, you know, it's the only really rural uh, art school in Ireland. It's one of a, a handful of rural art schools globally. And uh, and it's just because it's, of this rural locale and this small scale, it makes it a very, very unique uh, uh, educational place, to, educational uh, institution, a place to study and a place to engage with the Burm. Uh, we have a number of different uh, programs. I'm not going to, like I say, it's not really a, a talk about everything that the college does as such, but just to give you an overview, we're, we're quite small. We have around 30 to 55 students a year, give or take. Uh, we have a number of artists and residences, uh, art, artists and residents, and we bring in uh, summer groups and summer workshops as well. So we, we offer a whole range of, of, of artistic programs. We have a PhD, uh, which is around 10 students, MPhil, which is another uh, research degree. We have master's degrees in studio art, fine art, and we have uh, master's degrees in art and ecology. And I'll talk a little bit more about art and ecology in, in a few minutes. We also have higher diplomas, post-baccalaureates, summer school courses, workshops, residencies, and uh, an initiative that, that Mary Hawks Green has been pioneering for, for a number of years now, Resource. And resource is, uh, is a, an aspect of the college that looks at engaging creative practice and creative discipline across uh, different sectors uh, outside of uh, outside of the art school. So it brings together individuals who might be involved in leadership, might be involved in different uh, different areas, uh, different sectors, and, and applies creative thought, creative practice uh, right across uh, right across the spectrum in the protected environment of the barn as a place to you know, engage in reflection and uh, and and renewal and a sense as well, and that's a big part of what the college does. Is we, we and I'll talk about that in more detail in a second. Is this idea of of uh, of reflection of reflective space that can then be turned into a into to, to a space of action, a space of engagement. So I don't know, again, you know, some of you may or may not be familiar with Black Martin College in the US. It was uh, founded back in the 1930s in, uh, in North Carolina. And it's, uh, it was, a, it was a, again, a rural experiment to bring together artists and, and creative thinkers to, to, to build something new in terms of uh, mid 20th century artistic practice. It was, it was revolutionary, it was way ahead of its time. Uh, people like Buckminster Fuller built the first geodesic dome uh, at Black Mountain College. Uh, it was self-sustaining. You know, the students and staff worked together cooperatively. They farmed. They grew their own food. They uh, they, they lived. Uh, everyone lived on on site and maintained the site. The students and staff actually built some of the uh, some of the key buildings, and it was a. Uh, it was an incredible radical avant-garde experiment. Uh, which ended in the 1950s, but its legacy has really shaped you know, post-war American art. Uh, and you know, a lot of radical avant-garde artists uh, are associated with the college, but people like Joseph Albers, Annie Albers, uh, John Cage, Robert Rushenberg is a whole, Merce Cunningham, there's a whole range of artists that came through the college. Uh, Byrne has been compared to Black Martin College, and in a way we keep that spur of... Um, I'm just going to back that side again. We keep that sort of being based in the rural as a place of reflection and a place of engagement as as uh, almost you know as, as a core part of our ethos, but which takes its cue from Black Mountain College. So the college is active. It's a place of making. It's a place of engagement. Here we have you know students uh, working with faculty on, on different workshops. Uh, the previous slide give you a sense of studios. We have quite a big studio space, printmaking facilities, photography. Uh, and arrange, you know, 3D labs for, for sculpture, students working video, they work across all sorts of different disciplines. We're, we're specifically fine art focused. So, uh, and, and, and that gives us a, a platform to really engage with the bar and engage with students' ideas uh, in, in a fairly in-depth way. So what I want to do is just, uh, you know, again, I'm happy to take any questions around the history of the college or the function of the college. But like I say, I think the, the focus for this evening is really to look at the different artistic practices that, that sort of orbit around the college in a way. And as I say, it's it's a very, the 
Barron as a, as a place, uh, it's it's because of its remote locale, because of its uh, of its rural locale, it's it's it is a place that encourages reflection. It encourages a uh, artists, creative thinkers, students to maybe turn inwards, but not necessarily to stay inwards, but to to reflect and then to turn that reflection into a form of action, into a form of uh, engagement, either in the studio or in the community as well. So again, the power of the barn is, is landscape. You know, if, if, if you live here, if, if you've been here, if you visited here, you, you know, that power is immediately uh, apparent as soon as you step foot in the place. Uh, it's like no other part of Ireland. It's this unique karst limestone area. Like I said, it's a, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, a very specific, very unique ecosystem. And it's a multi-layered uh, place as well, because it's not just, when we talk about landscape, we're not just talking about something that's visual, something that you look at and that you experience visually. It's a place where people live. It's a place that's uh, it's been worked by communities, uh, been farmed. It's been, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's sustained rural communities, uh, you know, uh, for 6,000 years plus in a sense. And that, that history is apparent in the archaeology and, the, and the, in, the, in the landscape as well, all the different historical markers that exist in the borough. So it's a unique, it's a unique multi-layered landscape. You've got, you know, you do have, you've got the, the ecosystem, you've got the, uh, you've got, and you've got the social ecosystem as well. You know, the, the communities, the individuals, the people that use the space, that live in the space, that work with the space. And you've got the sense of deep time, archaeological time, uh, geological time and uh, you know and uh, and all of the mix all of the those elements of more uh, recent Irish history that go into that mix as well so when we when, when students or artists come to work uh, in the college or in the orbit of the college this is something that they're able to engage with uh the, this this multi-layered uh aspect of the barn as, as a sort of very very complex uh multi-layered place so to give you an idea this is some so students engage with painting so we've got you know painting and drawing and the core sort of fine art uh practices are still very central uh, at the college you know so students are able to, to dive into how they want to engage with this the the sheer physical presence and power of this landscape so this is one of our recent alumni uh tiffany love one of her paintings she works quite large scale and uh, she'll be running a workshop next week at the college as well so and and when we look at landscape, we're also encouraging students and to to go beyond pictorial sort of romantic uh, representation of a landscape and to dive a bit deeper. Uh, so that for some Tiffany's work, there's a lot of uh, you know there's, there's, she takes you sort of into the heart of the, of 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 of, the, of terrain in a way. You know, the very low horizon lines. She really. Gets, the paint becomes very physical because the, the landscape itself is very physical. You have to be very aware. You're aware of, you know, the body as it moves through the landscape. You know, uh, so the paintings themselves become these very physical embodiments of the landscape. We've got some other works from other students that sort of testify to this physicality, bringing in, actually bringing the landscape into the work. Elements of, uh, you know, those elements. You know, soil of, of uh, flora from the landscape that are brought in as well. So for students, we get a lot of uh, painting and drawing students, and we get a lot of artists who are engaged in painting practice come through the college. And I think uh, there's always a very lively discussion about, well, how do you, you know, you've got the power of this place exists in front of your eyes. So what do you do with that? How do you? translate that into into an image into an image that becomes an, an experience for the viewer so i think that, that that sense of scale that sense of physicality becomes something that, that i often find that students and, and artists that come here want to engage with as well and again it's that that word translation is important like how you translate something as, as complex uh, and as powerful as, as the baron is how you translate that into uh, an art form in a way another uh for Former student who, who also came back as, a, as an artist in residence, and you can't get a sense of scale. This is a large scale graphite, uh, charcoal and graphite drawing, so it's, it's truly monumental. The slide doesn't do it any justice whatsoever, but it's almost like a cinematic in scale. So, this is another example of what I mean by you know, students or, or artists that come here that haven't been here before or are overwhelmed by the, the power of the place. 
Because of course I talked about the karst and I mentioned you know the, the the topography of the landscape, but of course you've got this incredible coast as well and the power of the Atlantic, the power of the sea, and that's also uh, something that, that that artists and students that, that, that work in the orbit of psychology are drawn to as well. So this this image you know is taken from uh, uh, the Doolan coast, quite close to to Doolan, but again this could be any part of this part of the coast or even the Iron Islands as well. And then uh, when we're speaking about the coast, uh, you know, drawing and doesn't have to be done on paper in, in the traditional uh, sense. You know, we have uh, students have gone into the landscape and worked to make drawings physically in the landscapes. This is Fenor Beach. And anyone who's been to Fenor will know that the sand on top is yellow. But if you make a mark in it or you scrape it, the sand underneath is quite dark. It's black. So it's, 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 it'll, it really lends itself. To, to drawing, to anyone who's interested in the, in the practice of drawing, to making a mark. And again, it's back to scale and to uh, really engaging with the landscape physically. And, and when you draw like this, it also becomes a physical process. It becomes performative. And there's also something really uh, refreshing that, you know, these, these works are temporary. The land, the sea reclaims these drawings as well. So you can make a mark on the landscape, and then it, it's it's uh, the the time and tide uh, uh, returns it to the ocean again. And something we're very conscious of at the college is is the burn code. You know, leave no trace. You know, you can make a mark, you can engage, but in a way that you know maybe might work for documentation, but that leaves no physical trace on the landscape and doesn't alter the landscape permanently in in, in any in any way. Uh, another uh, student. Uh, um, I created this huge uh, lump of, of chalk. Some of these are advancing by themselves. I do apologize. So um, I'll just have to flip back and forward. Uh, and, and basically carried it across the, the, the limestone course to make a line drawing. And as 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 the chalk uh, traversed the, the limestone, it gradually disintegrated. So this is a performance as well as a drawing as well. And then uh, sculpture. You know, we have students who really engage with... Uh, you know, I think the, the, the natural forms that exist here, you know, the different mosses, the different lichens, the different, the different uh, just the proliferation of plant life that exists here lends itself to creative interpretation in terms of sculptural forms, also in terms of drawing, in terms of painting, right across media. But you find that uh, students will, uh, and artists often really engage with the, the diversity or the plurality of, of uh of forms that exist in the landscape and, uh, you know, the, through the hazel woods uh, and through all the, the different plant life that are barns here as well. Of course, you all know that the barn, the barn is famous for the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the wildflowers that, that, that explode in, uh, in, in May, April and May. We often have students that are here from September through to April, so they might get a little bit of that, but a lot of them don't get the full explosion that takes place in May. But even for, even so, throughout the summer, throughout the autumn, throughout the winter, you've got this incredible uh, range of, of, uh, of flora and, and plant life uh, that often finds its way into creative uh, interpretation. And I mentioned the coast and a big part of, uh, you know, there's a big part of, so we, as I said at the start, you know, we have a, a degree in art and ecology and ecology is a big focus of what we do. And I think it's, we, we couldn't be based in a place like the barn in a rural locale uh, and and in a protected environment such as the barn and not engage with with ecology uh, in a deep way through, through the college. So a lot of the students that we get coming into the art and ecology degree programs or, or they want, maybe they focus focus on, uh, will have an ecological focus on their PhD research, uh, engage in, in different ways with uh, with the barn as an ecosystem. And as a, a, as a big part of looking at ecosystems, of course, is, is the uh, the impact of climate change on the environment. So this uh, student, J.D. Whitman, who is uh, currently just transferred onto the PhD program, is also one of our alumni. Uh, J.D. has worked uh, extensively looking at sea plastics uh, looking at uh, you know, climate action and looking at building awareness through pedagogy and through, through engaging communities uh, to build awareness of, of the sort of the climate crisis that's impacting our seas and our coasts and working with the uh, University of Galway, working with marine biologists 
So she's got a network of of of, of researchers and uh, uh, across the very scientific disciplines that she's working with to build an artistic practice that really hopes to educate and inform and and uh, pr promote change in this in a sense. So uh, this is just an image. I mean, her work's quite complex. She works in video, sculpture, installation. And you see from this image, a lot of the work is gathered in sea plastic and detritus that's washed up on the beaches here, forms the core of her work. We have a lot of students who, who, work, who work to some extent or other with this, this idea. Uh, uh, and the, 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 it is the, one of the defining uh, topics of our moment is climate change. So we find that it's a big concern for students and artists. Elizabeth Blenner and other alumni. She also collected the, you know, plastic and, uh, and ended up building a raft uh, out of it and, and setting it, you know, setting off to, you know, I think this is over in Bell Harbor. So almost like, so for her, she's building a life raft uh, in a way. So it becomes, her work becomes a sort of an ironic commentary on uh, how do we save ourselves? How do we get out of this predicament? What steps can we take? To throw a lifeline, uh, or to build a lifeline out of this uh, this uh, this situation that we're, that we're in at the moment with the Anthropocene and with climate change. So, climate action is a big part of uh, of of the the ecology focus at the college. Another one of our recent alumni, Amelia Amelia Raffle, looking up migratory birds uh, patterns and how they've been in fact uh, impacted by by climate change as well. So this image gives you an idea, gives you a little bit of a hint of the campus as well. This is a corner of the gallery, and I'll show more uh, images of the gallery a little bit later. And uh, she created this large scale mural. So again, it's another extension of paint. Thing, practice drawing, practice printmaking uh, to create these large scale works that engage uh, the audiences, but also build awareness. And her work, uh, some of her work uh, invited the audience to participate, to make art, to make work. Another work that she produced had QR codes with statistics and facts about different uh, species of birds and uh, different migratory patterns and how they're impacted by climate change and actions that, that we as, as citizens can take to uh, to try to um, take action uh, in that respect. So another thing uh, that we, you know, I talked about reflection and reflection being a big part of the ethos of the college, but another part of it is uh, resourcefulness as well. The college is quite small and we, we make a, a key point that we don't have all the bells and whistles uh, in terms of the latest in facilities, the latest in technology, the latest, the latest toys, you know, the latest gadgets, the latest gimmicks. We have what, what is required and what is necessary to, to build and sustain uh, an artistic practice, whether you're a student or an artist in residence or someone doing a workshop. And a big part of that is resourcefulness because we have to be careful of our footprint. We have to be careful of our use of materials, our engagement with materials, and again with this climate consciousness, this ethos of climate consciousness. So in that respect, students often upcycle. They find uh, uh, material around campus, or they're able to locally source material from local farmers just to realize and transform that material into into their creative vision, which is often, you know, as you can see from this image uh, from. One of our alumni, uh, Jeff Austin, uh, is you know can also translate into the weird and the wonderful in a, in a way. Now, if you can see on the right, there's an image that looks like a drawing, looks like a mandala. That is actually uh, created using dead flies. So that's the height of resourcefulness. It's incredibly geometric, incredibly precise. But uh, at the time, uh, Jeff collected all of these uh, dead flies and uh, created this this incredible mandala. Uh, you know, as, as a result, and also locally wool you know from local farms that, that, that's in the area as well so there's a big emphasis on upcycling and using materials that are close to hand and with that in that respect uh, this engagement with ecology translates into into growing and into making your own materials katarina gribkov is another one of our phd students and she has in her time here at the college she has built a garden uh, and grows her own plants specifically to make uh, to produce wild dyes. So it's a, it's a sort of a sustainable dye garden, and uh, she's carried out numbers of workshops with local schools and uh, wild dye workshops with, with various groups. 
and uh, her practice also has a textile focus. So she creates you know these textiles, produces the, the wild dyes are produced from her her garden on the, on the college campus, and they result in these artworks that uh, you know can then be shared with broader audiences. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, again, you know, they say the barn as an ecosystem, as a complex ecosystem. And we bring a lot of different voices into the college throughout uh, over the course of a year in a given year. So we bring in environmental scientists, geologists. So we have a, we have a, a module in environmental ecosystem science. Um, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a second, but... Uh, but when we look at place, you know, place is never something that's fixed. You know, the barren isn't something that's fixed. You know, as we see, it's it's a, it's it's a repository of deep time, of, of geological time, of archaeological time, and it's a place that's still in motion. You know, it's a place that's still it's still it's farmed tourism, and the changes that arise from tourism. You know, if anyone's been aware of some of the debates that have arisen this summer around, you know, the, the increase in tourism here is. You know, all of this attests to a, an environment that is fluid, that's dynamic, that's not fixed, it's not static, and it's subject to how we interact with it, those of us who live and work here. So we've got students uh, also engage with this idea of, of the barn as, uh, as, as a network, as a system, as, as something that's complex. On as I say. So Astorine David, another one of our limbs who's working with the college at the moment, uh, her work uh, really investigated investigates the uh, the barren as a system. And, and she's particularly interested in queer ecologies to look in a, you know, arts, again, it's like outside of the, the center, outside of the periphery, outside of the dominant narrative. And I think that's a big part of what the college can facilitate because we're away from the center, we're on the periphery, and it's a space where ideas can percolate and then reinform and filter back into the center again. Veronica uh, Constantino, is, who's I'll talk about towards the end of the talk, uh, I'll give her another mention, but she's also works with systems ecosystems. And also her work taps into some photography, so she's interested in you know, looking at, uh, you know, using the microscope to create photographic images. But she's also interested in the sense of community engagement. So how do you, okay, you can show these in the gallery, you can, you know, you can, people can enjoy them. But then what? I think for her, she's also interested in building that relationship with people to get people to engage, to, to participate, to to join in uh, collaborative acts of art making. So she creates uh, scenarios and opportunities for the audience to participate in art making, to participate and produce, you know, collaborative collective acts of play in a way. And I think for her, you know, create, the creative practice is very much about play. It's about uh, doing things together. You know, we often think about the artist as a solitary figure, you know, in, uh, in a sense and that, that but we're in a situation where you know artists are um, social beings and can be facilitators can be catalysts can be uh and as citizens we're also participants in um in, uh, and in, in in creating events and and in, in making things happen in a way so there's lots of different ways there's no one way to think about being an artist no no one way to engage with, with the bar and in that sense so uh Again, moving on, another a student who brought dance. Uh, this was a student from Venezuela, and she brought uh, this incredibly colorful dance into the barn landscape. You know, this uh, performed for cattle and for, for students who were around as well. But this, again, this remarkable explosion of, of color and the celebration of life and of movement and of the body, bringing that into this the time of year, this sort of quite austere uh, landscape that the barn becomes as autumn turns into winter. So again, it's back that incredible sense of play that, that the landscape encourages as well. And, as, and, and uh, also that invitation to engage and interpret and to think imaginatively about how you want to uh, engage with this place. Another student, John Freeman, who again, <clears throat> made video works back to the coast, all about acts of transformation, because I think that's one of the things that we, as artists, what we do, whether you're taking pigment as paint or whether you're taking a camera or whether you're you know working with photography working with digital media what we do we take ideas we take materials and we uh, and we transform 
engaged every every mark every every word every 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 part of the process is about an act of transformation so what john was really interested was in this sort of personal transformation uh you know and and bringing that into into the into the local landscape into the local environment almost like as a as a ritual of transformation becoming oneself becoming who one truly can be in a, in this environment in a way so when we talk about transformation we're also talking about you know this is back artists are about changing materials and ideas you know we're also looking at how ideas can help change uh change mindsets change how we think about the uh the world we live in at the minute and our role in it uh <clears throat> as citizens so again you know this is a still from a student who who made a film using uh you know very much engaged with the limestone very much engaged with the landscape um and again, performative action. So we've, you know, like I said, there's a range of creative disciplines. So this, you know, there's a lot of students who are engaged with uh, being in the landscape and making work with it within the landscape. And as I said, within the, the framework of the Barn Code, this is on campus. And again, this is this is a work that looks at elements. You know, water uh, brings about transformation. Fire brings about transformation. Of course, fire is very pertinent at the minute again in terms of climate change, as given the summer that we've seen uh, across Europe and, uh, and other parts of the world, Hawaii at the moment as well. So fire is a very potent, uh, loaded metaphor for, for change and renewal and, uh, and chaos uh, at the moment. And, uh, and a few years ago, uh, with the support of Clare County Council, we also, uh, and uh, Anya Phillips, one of our, our main uh, tutors here, worked with a group of students to produce a, a film that's toured around the different film festivals internationally in response to this iconic work of land art uh, by the artist Richard Long. I don't know if any of you know this, but if you go to the Doolan Coast and you start to walk along the, the limestone, uh, along the Doolan Coast, uh, there's a circle uh, made of, of, of limestone. and. Uh, Richard Long, the, the British uh, land artist, made this circle back in 1975. A lot of his work was temporary. He would make these circles and then storms, weather, uh, would just return the land to its original or or turn it to, uh, would reshape it, would erase these works, a bit like the tide with the uh, the beach drawing. So the, the original artwork is in London, it's a photograph. But this work still exists, and I think it, it exists because it's been maintained by dog walkers, walkers, people who may or may not know that it's a walker for Richard Long. But it, it has survived uh, for almost 50 years. And with uh, Clare County Council, had a, uh, the Arts Office had an initiative to, to restore it and to mark its, its, its presence a few years ago during the pandemic. So that we, they worked with the college uh, to produce a video. You can see it as far as I know, it's still on the college website. But, and uh, so this uh, this site became a place for engagement as well. So it's, it's students and artists uh, working with the pre-existing artwork in the landscape to activate it and reimagine it and, and, and bring it to life in, in a way. This is a an aerial image of it um, from, you know, aerial still from the, uh, the video. And so I mentioned this, I've talked a lot about, you know, uh, painting, you know, uh, drawing, photography, all these different ways that artists make work. A few years ago, we, we introduced a new course in walking as artistic practice. Now, I don't know if any of you, how many of you are artists who have joined the talk uh, or you know how much you know about walking as art practice, but and you might wonder, well, what, how, what am I talking about? But uh, walking can be... Uh, you know, if, if, if art is any act of intention that, that brings about a form of transformation, then moving the body through space is a form of performance. And so the act of walking becomes perf uh, performative. And this is going back to the 60s as well as artists, uh, <clears throat> Richard Long being one of them, and Hamish Fulton and others started the, the idea of the walk as a, as a form of artistic engagement. So what we do, we have we've a big emphasis on walking at the college uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there's no better way to engage with the landscape than getting into it. 
being physically in the landscape, walking on the landscape, walking through the landscape, but also the act of walking becomes reflective. As you walk, you start to shed the baggage that you might have in the studio or the classroom or the work or whatever, you know, that baggage you start to shed and you start to open yourself up to other ideas, other awareness of the landscape, awareness of sounds, awareness of the different sights, awareness of the whole sensory experience of being in the landscape. So we look at walking as something that's as a form of sensory engagement that, the, that you can then translate into something else. It can be the walk in its own right. It can be enough. You can translate it into drawing, into photography, into film, uh, right across the artistic disciplines. We find so we find that we offer this as a class, and we find that it's it's very very popular as a class. But even so, outside of uh, outside of being a, an academic um, program, it's it's something that I think is 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 a, is a natural fit for this landscape. We have walking festivals. Walking is a big part of what uh, what, what what you know what what draws people to the barn. So we've sort of merged that with the with the uh, with the artistic program at the college, and it continues to grow and evolve. Foraging also, again, you know, we're talking about upcycling and uh, you know, you know, thinking locally, acting globally in that respect. And uh, so when we think about local, there's also you know the the food culture here, the sustainable looking at uh, you know supporting local businesses and and sustain and a sustainable approach to. Uh, the food industry here in the region as well part of that is which is outside of businesses but which 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 exists here is, is you know they, they need to forage for different edible forms of seaweed so uh, david donahue who's uh, an artist and a writer who has uh, been in the orbit of the college for many years brings groups of students and artists on foraging trips they will identify different forms of edible seaweed Students also use the seaweed as dye as well as a wild dye, uh, you know. So anyone, so this is also becomes a way to learn about the uh, the uh, the fauna of the barren as well, um, and that's a knowledge that I think is arguably been lost, uh, you know, over the course of the twentieth century. Our ancestors would have known the name of every plant, every herb, the properties of every herb, the healing properties of every plant, the edible, what, what's edible, what's poisonous. What can be used for dyes? Like all of this indigenous knowledge was, would have been incredibly rich here in the west of Ireland, and it's gradually, you know, industrialization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, immigration. That knowledge has been lost to a large extent, but it's not gone. And I think it's, uh, you know, so one of the things that we do is is, is reengage with that um, through through you know simple acts of foraging. And as part of that, also, I mean, we, you know, uh, Gordon Darcy, who I'm sure you know uh, many of you should be familiar with, is uh, you know teaches at the college, teaches Irish studies, and and Gordon also, and as, as you know, if you know Gordon, you know Gordon's work, he's also an artist as well. Also brings uh, students into the landscape to engage with again, like I mentioned at the beginning, this stuff, all of these multi layered aspects, the ecosystem, but also the social and political history as well. Um, so. So, uh, and I think it's that engagement with place that that, that I think is is crucial. You know, all of these different facets, which I hope I hope is coming across over the over the course of the talk so far. So I'm conscious of time, so I'm not hopefully not uh, hopefully not boring anyone to tears. Um, but uh, and again, we partner with Bar and Bio, so I want to you know thanks to Anya and thanks to Bar and Bio for you know for inviting me to do this talk this evening. And and Bar and Bio teaches into our program. We organize walks, we organize lectures, students participate in the learning landscapes uh conference. You know, we've had a long standing deep relationship with Bar and Bio as, as a community partner. We also partner with the Geopark uh, and again we bring in uh, Eamon Doyle as a geologist uh and and again there's uh, there's there's an there are opportunities for students to engage with these conversations, artists to engage with these conversations about stewardship of this landscape. How do we look after it? How do we protect it? Uh, the, quite, the key crucial question of sustainability in an era now that we've seen this summer of you know, sort of mass global tourism. So what are they, what's the balance? I mean, how do we work with that? What's, what, 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 what role, if any, can creative individuals and artists play in that? Um, and again, you know, some of uh, our other part, we, 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 um, other different, other ways that we engage with the ecology, 
of the region is through our global ecologies uh, summer school, global ecology studio, and that sort of brings together environmental science and studio um, over a four week period every every July, June, and July. So again, there's a very active, engaged part of this where students get into the landscape. They look at, in this case, turf being cut. So it's looking at tradition, history, there's elements of studying, of uh, storytelling, folklore, all of the different aspects of, of social uh, and economic life uh, in the barn, as well as uh, as well as this, the 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 science of of of, uh, of, of the, the ecosystem science in that respect. Uh, so there's just an image from a few years ago where a group of artists from Chile worked to work, you know, collaborated to produce some sculpture up on the limestone, biodegradable sculpture. And then we have artists in residence, you know, and again, artists in residence, you know, whether they've been here, if it's anyone coming here for the first time, is, as I say, usually in awe of the power of the place. Uh, and there's different, very open ended, very fluid ways of engaging with the landscape. Frank Webster uh, was an artist, was here back in the autumn, created these plein air watercolor images of, of the landscape. Uh, very, very uh, you know, using the tradition of plein air, but also immersed himself in photography to take some of these absolutely uh, quite stunning images of uh, panoramic images of the landscape. And I think a big part of any artist coming here who hasn't been here before, a big part of what they do is go out into the landscape and uh, you know to really experience it, like I say, physically through the act of walking. This is more of Frank's work, and he's translated some of these into the large scale paintings uh, uh, in recent, uh, you know, during the spring. And uh, you know, and it's, like I said, the college is a, it's a creative hub. It's a, it's a network. It's a place that is connected with the broader community. It's uh, it really takes artists and and you know a deep dive uh, into themselves and into the place, into the landscape, and, uh, and and has many different arms, many different tendrils, and another arm of which are our summer workshops, which are running at the moment, and which ran uh, earlier in the summer too. So these are, this is a group that I worked with um, last year, and I have a I run a workshop in walking and painting, which merges some of that, that walking philosophy that I talked about with, with, with the studio, how you translate the act of walking in the studio. So here's some of the walkers from last year. And again, we have artists from beginner level to advanced level, but everyone's very open and very um, open to just to taking risks and to having fun and really uh, throwing themselves into the experience of just being in this unique and you know visually stimulating, but also challenging environment. And then to the gallery, and I think I'm sort of wrapping up and coming to the end here. So uh, we also have a big part of, yeah, we. You know, we're a creative hub, a creative center, teaching creative practice amongst artists, the work of resource, bringing people together to have, you know, uh, conversations about the critical issues of our time and this reflective space of the environment. So, and we also have the gallery, which is at the sort of heart of the college. And it's a showcase for exhibitions. Uh, we bring international artists to the gallery. We're, we're supported by Clare County Council for our burn, burn annual exhibition, which brings international artists to the college. And we, and we show local artists in recent years who've shown uh, Rita Vaub, uh, our best artist, uh, Anne Korf, also Kimbara. And, you know, so we merged the global and the local and uh, through the gallery space. Deirdre Mahoney, a local artist, uh, very much involved with local ecologies and uh, and uh, questions around sustainability. And, and, and uh, you know, so exhibition from a, year, a few years ago, looking at the potato and uh, looking at parallels, you know, um, how, the history of the potato here in Ireland and, and also in the Americas. Work from some of the student shows for the, you know, the limes, the, the different proliferation of plant life starts to inform uh, some of the work created in, across in textiles and sculpture uh, in the studios. Another artist, Robert Platt, uh, also, again, very much in, involved with, with landscape and, and engagement with the act of looking and visual perception in the landscape. Last summer's exhibition, Hugh Pocock uh, from the US, who also teaches on the summer school, exhibition No Man's Land, where Hugh has a project to create a, an area, a bit like the Harris Acre, in you know, where that's completely off limits to humans, where nature can return 
you know, without any uh, footprint or imprint of uh, fingerprints of 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 of, uh, of human beings, in a sense. We had a great uh, symposium and, and and connection with this bringing together, uh, you know, speakers from New Zealand looking at the rights of nature, uh, speakers speakers from Ireland and New Zealand looking at the rights of nature. Can nature, uh, you know, where do the rights of nature sit in terms of law? law in a sense, so, and uh, and as I say, I mean, it's all of this is builds community. You know, it's a uh, it's uh, we're a small. Let's look at Bloom, by the way. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Luca Bloom, performing in the gallery, and uh, you know, it's and so community is important. We're a small creative space. We bring together artists, and academics, and. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second. And um, but at the core of this is community. You know, the artists are like I say, we have a we're social beings, we have a social responsibility. The bar you know, is a place of reflection, is a place that allows you to turn inward, is a place that allows you to take that deep dive into engagement with whatever your ideas are. But they have to come out. You know, as artists, we have to share our ideas, we have to share them with the world, we have to share our work. We're, we're social beings, and as, as such, we have a, we have social responsibility. You know what 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 is it that we wish to say about this place and uh, its its uniqueness, its its uh, and and its importance of uh, its if its stewardship and its uh, its sustainability as we move forward. And uh, but none of that can happen without a community. You know, it's a community that sustains um, all creative practices in a way. So so a community is is, is a big part of the ethos. So I just want to end um, again. I guess it's been quite broad brush. Hopefully, I haven't uh, gone on too long, <laughs> but hopefully, I've given you an idea of some of the things that happen around the college, in the college, in the orbit of the college. Some of the different ways that artists and students engage with the barn as as this as this very unique, uh, special place. And I also want to end by just inviting you, if you're in the Kinvara or Ballybone area, to come tomorrow night to our MA exhibition, Growth and Ecotone, uh, Diana Boyer and Veronica uh, Constant, too. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Who uh, will be showing their work for their MA exhibition tomorrow evening. We'll be launching that at six o'clock in the gallery at the college. So you're all, all uh, more than welcome. And we'd love to, to see you, come and see the work in person. And there are going to be two very special exhibitions, very immersive in the gallery. And my last image, if you want more information on the college and this, a lot more information, a lot more images. There's the website there as well. But uh, I will leave it at that. So and I'm sure there might be some questions. Oh, fabulous, Connor. Thank you so much, particularly given the fact that you've been unwell. There was no sign of it. That was just amazing. Um, so interesting and inspiring. And um, I'm amazed that, you know, we take a place as an inspiration, but then all of the hugely individual um, expressions that arise from that, you know, that it's 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 definitely amazing to see such a variety of work um, and I loved the piece about you know that need for reflection and maybe the space that the burn allows for reflection um, and walking as artistic practice I am now holding on to that I'm going to see where I can go with that and whether um, we can work that into um, more of what Burn Bio does so if people do have questions pop them in there um, and and while you're maybe Thinking of them, I had one, and this is classic uh, scientist meets artist and hopefully no collision. But what I was wondering was, you know, what's been happening in the College of Arts over the years is just amazing. But is there a way of quantifying or knowing the impact that having a space like this um, and, you know, the various people who have come to the burn because of it? Um, and I suppose also then the kind of uh, opportunity that the local community has had to engage with this type of work and these people maybe it's not you know as I said it's a, a very a scientific way of looking at the thing which may, may not be appropriate but is there kind of a way of quantifying or knowing the impact um, that somewhere like this has apart from obviously the the impact of the the actual artwork that has been produced I'll just I'll stop the share. But, uh, sorry, on your apologies, you were breaking up a little bit during the question. But am I um, am I right in saying you're you're asking about how we uh, is there a way to measure the impact of the some of the work that the college is doing? For sure, yeah, and and even just the existence <laughs> of the college. Yeah, well, I think without without a sort of a, a sort of 
an empirical study as such. I think we do it for other ways. I think one is the work of our alumni, uh, in particular, um, you know, the, the, the artists have gone on to, you know, the work of staff and alumni in disseminating their work through exhibitions, through publications, um, <clears throat> you know, nationally and internationally is really one of the key testaments to that. So we have, you know, like the key teaching staff, you know, uh, all, all of whom are sort of practicing artists, including myself. Uh, and especially staff like like Dr. Eileen Hutton, who is sort of principal lecturer in, in art and ecology. You know, her work, her research gets disseminated through uh, group exhibitions, solo exhibitions around the country and different publications. Also, also the PhD students as well. You know, I think um, we have we have a there's a sense sense of you know being able to, work being published, work being shared, work being exhibited, work being uh, noticed. Um, in the sort of art sphere uh, in Ireland and beyond. And I think that that is one of the key testimonies in, in that respect. I also, I, I didn't say, and I should have said at the start, that we're sort of unique in a way that we are the first art and ecology masters in Europe. And we we sort of, and I'm not blowing our trumpet here, you know, in a way, but, um, but I think we started this program 10 years ago, and since then, we now see there's new masters in art and ecology have popped up in London and Cork and Dublin. They're popping up elsewhere. So in a way, and we, we're, but we're also very keen to be part of those networks and to build those networks. And I think, um, so I think, I don't know, I'm not sure if that's really answering the question, but I think the work sort of reaches, uh, you know, through our, our the profile of the college, the visibility of it through, you know, the exhibitions through publications and through the research profile that we're building as well uh that's one of the key ways in which the impact is felt but another way also is that it's draw for people i think it's the fact that it's we're one of the few places that you can come and study art and ecology uh we're one of the few places that's that's rural uh that's in a landscape like this uh, and uh, and the reputation of the work we've been doing since 1994 means that we are constantly you know we're, we're we're sort of at capacity in terms of student numbers and and that there's there's always uh uh inquiries uh, and uh you know and, and there's always interest in you know partnerships and relationships to work with us in that respect so i also take that as an indicator of the sort of the the success of the work we're doing in that respect for sure. No, that, that's perfect, Connor. And on that note, actually, we do have a question in from Thea. Um, she said, thank you very much for sharing such a rich description of the college and landscape. Um, she had one specific, uh, they have one specific question about the name of the artist that uses um, a micro, uses microscope photography. And then second one, which is, I think, getting to what you were mentioning there, how would one explore a collaborative project? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of artists. It was Astra Reem David, uh, was using the microscope and Veronica Constanu, and I'm not pronouncing, I'm sorry, Veronica, I'm, if, you're, if you're listening, I'm not <laughs> butchering your last name. She's from Cyprus. So Veronica's work will be on display tomorrow. Night. But uh, both of those, both of those students uh, use the microscope and it's something we acquired this the microscope last year and it's become quite an important tool uh, in, in terms of how we look, you know, how you perceive, how you, you know, uh, landscape and uh, take a different approach and different uh, different angle into it, uh, in a sense. So, uh, and the second question was how you would how to how um how to approach a collaborative project. I think, or maybe how somebody could collaborate with the Burn College of Art or artists within it, perhaps. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to know. There's not there's not really a formula. I think um, the crucial thing, you know, for us, I mean, I mentioned during the talk that um, you know, there's there's often this idea of the artist as being the individual, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing. I mean, I'm, my own practice is sort of a lot of what I do. I have to be by myself in the studio, but I also work collaboratively as well. So I think I think the crucial thing is really to to have a group that are open to working. You know, working with you on a project, and and being a you know and being able to to, to navigate, able to facilitate and navigate that. Uh, 
so we, we have a we do a lot of workshops and collaboration at the college so it's not that we just sort of let students loose and right off you go collaborate you know there are certain you know there's there's an ethical aspect to collaboration you know again about mutual respect you know hearing each other's voices listening to each other's voices sharing uh you know keeping your ego in check to a certain extent as well which i think you know it's uh you know being able to park those uh you know being able to be open and to be and, and to the crucial thing for me, when you collaborate you know, uh, something else emerges. You know, you one person has their own ideas, two people have their own ideas. But when you put two people together, two or more people together, they create what can be referred to as a third, a new space, a third space. And once you create that new space, you're creating a space of potential. And that's what's exciting, you know, that you may not have a clear idea of what you're going to do, but that space and that conversation allows that to happen. But I don't know. I mean, I know I'm, I'm talking about this in a very general way um, rather than the very nuts and bolts way. But, you know, you can tell me if I'm off the beaten track, if it's uh, but we I know. But for us at the college, we. We do a lot of workshops on collaboration, you know, because it's, uh, uh, you know, there, there are there are way, there are pros and cons, you know, there are do's and don'ts, you know, and I think um, but that aspect of respect and sharing and that ethos of sharing, I think, is really important in that respect. Perfect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's one yeah. comment here, I think, maybe from Jody Ruffner, who you, you may know, who had brought groups of students um, from Southern Illinois University. And I think uh, singing the praises of um, the College of Art, which is nice to see. But then another question, I suppose, that we might finish up on um, from Shaney Herman, who wonders if there is a way to get involved from abroad. So I, I know we're all on Zoom now, which is amazing and um, that we can have people from all over the world. Um, getting involved but is that something that um is part of what the the college of art are offering or uh, other ways that people i suppose from abroad might get involved absolutely there are different ways you know if you and we have a lot of international students we have more international students than irish students uh we're very internationally focused um so in terms of stuff getting involved you know from abroad you know from an international perspective that's that's sort of at the core of what we do. Um, so if, if, if you've an inquiry about study or programs of study, uh, I'll, 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 you know, you can contact uh, my colleague, uh, Lisa, and, uh, you know, I, 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 she's, I'll give you her uh, contact in a second. But also for uh, residencies, you know, we, we have an artist in residency program that I mentioned, and a lot of those artists are international. We get a lot of Canadian uh, artists coming through the residency program um and again you know we've also i mean we mentioned the summer workshops we have international participants and those are summer workshops as well so absolutely there's every opportunity to get involved you know from abroad and uh i think that the you know for anyone who's interested it'll be lisa at barncollege.ie and that would be for any questions around academics or, or artists and residents uh the residency program lisa will be able to give you more information on that Brilliant, Connor. I we're just right on time. I love that. <laughs> just at nine o'clock, I think we'll uh, we'll say thank you very, very much. As I said again, a particular thanks given the fact that you've been unwell. Um, and we lovely to see so many turning out this evening. Um, and we hopefully will see you as well uh coming along for our September webinar, which details will be circulated for uh before too long. But with that said, um I'll let you all back to your evenings and talk soon and thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. And thanks, Bye. everyone, for listening. Appreciate it.